Uh, we are live here on Facebook for Uriel Etzetic and a joint event with our great partners at Valley Bait Midrash and Arizona Juice for Justice, acknowledging that we are happy to bring in this type of programming to everybody who is joining us today. So today's topic is our Jewish Native American Dialogue, um, a series that we've been really having um, to focus in on how we can better have communications and community with our Native American friends. Looking forward to really um, having a dialogue series today. Today's our, our topic is on tradition and ritual. And what does it mean to me? So I encourage everybody to really in the spirit of, of, of dialogue to open up. I wanna introduce uh, really quickly, one of my uh, close friends who I've been really had um, the honor to to getting closer into uh, and, and learning way more than I would ever dreamed of uh, with my my great friend here, Debbie Nez Manuel uh, from, uh, from the Dine folks, who has really been helping me understand how to be an ally in the Native American community and how to truly, truly start to have some great uh, dialogue together, have conversations and look on how we can help our own community and um, really start to understand where it is that allyship can can really start to make a, a change in in the way that we we talk to each other, where it isn't just okay, what can I do here and there, but true dialogue and sharing our, our same cultural experiences. So Debbie, thank you so much for for joining us today. I, I really appreciate you, and I want to start off with a, a question uh, for you, Debbie. What is just to start us off? What does tradition mean to you? Um, it depends on the time of year. I think there's a lot of um, um, discussions about this, but it, traditionally speaking, is it's always a time of year. So today is October. Um, the month is October. And in Navajo, we call this a launch. And it has to do with our new year. So when the, and it wouldn't have started on October 1st, per se. It would be on the moon. So once the new moon arrived, even prior to October 1st, that would have been the, the beginning of our season. And so um, a lot of activities happen um, at this time on Navajo Nation. Um, a lot of uh, the beauty way ceremonies that, um, that start generally in the evening and they go throughout the night. A lot of prayers and songs and gatherings um, are usually occurring at this time but with this pandemic happening um, that's something that is 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 something that we're missing so kind of that's that's a response one of the many responses as we um, move into December uh, many of the Pueblos um, and other cultures will be celebrating the solstice so that's going to be happening in um, mid uh, December. And uh, that's when we describe that there's there's two two deities um, that will be traveling um, away away from the um, a, a specific place and at this during the solstice their faces meet each other they acknowledge one another and then they turn back again and the season the seasons will change so I, I that's just one thing but. Language is another part of what tradition is, um, understanding the power of language and um, the difference between the, the, um, the, really the ancestral languages that, you know, are so important for prayer and ceremony versus like conversation language. Um, and even today, you know, making sure we find the right terminology for issues that are related to modern, modern day happenings. Thank you so much. And I also want to like uh, follow up and ask my great friend Rosetta here, who's also joining us. Um, uh, Rosetta, what does tradition mean to you in the sense of like, how does it keep you going from your own cultural stance? Uh, what does tradition mean to you? Well, tradition, thank you for asking um, Eddie for me to join in on this group. And it's always an honor to be in the same virtual room with Debbie. I, I admire her so much. You know, I've had the honor of being with her during a various events throughout the past couple of years. And 
Debbie is very traditional. I, I love her concepts. I love the way she's growing her children up, her three daughters that, you know, she's, she's got her hands full there. And I love that she is grounded. She speaks her language. She practices her culture. And as far as my tradition, you know, I didn't grow up traditionally. I can say that I am Rosebud Sioux from Sakangu, Lakota in South Dakota, but I was raised in foster care. I was raised with white parents. I did not grow up in my native culture. Therefore, I had to seek out tradition as I grew into a young woman. You know, 18 years old, I finally, uh, you know, found my birth parents um, and connected there. So tradition to me has um, been a long, hard fought battle. But tradition is what grounds you, you know, however your tradition comes to you, what feels right to you, you know, how you embrace your culture. And for this form here, and for you, Eddie, having to reach out to the Native American community, I truly appreciate you. But tradition for me is surrounding myself and, and embracing the culture as I see here in the valley, which means I try to participate in Native American events when they happen. And of course, we haven't been able to do that safely within the last six months, but to embrace the culture as you see it. And I see it is there are numerous people here in the valley that are cultural keepers, such as Debbie's husband, Royce Manuel. He's, he's beautiful, gentlemen. And you have to seek it out and I seek it out. So I don't have anything traditional in my background, but I seek it out on a daily basis here. And you know, as a 60 year old woman living here in the Valley, I'm doing the best I can. I Thank you. That. I love that. Thank you so much, Rosetta. So now we're gonna open it up to our Jewish side uh, in, in our Jewish uh, community here. What does ritual mean to you? And I share, uh, really, I, I truly share um, Rosetta's feelings of, of really connecting now into her, um, into her culture and spirituality as I'm now connecting into my spirituality and my conversion to Judaism. But I'm also really connecting and trying to figure out my roots and my indigenous roots in Mexico and, and what that looks like and finding out that I have Purepecha uh, blood and that I was born on a bed of plantains and, and learning all this beautiful culture that I, where I come from and understanding the, the rituals in my people. And I've seen that there is such a beautiful connection with my spirituality, seeing that the, the, the rituals of Shabbat, of bringing that peace of every day looking forth to that Sabbath, that Shabbat, Every, every day looking forth to that Friday, that understanding that for that time until sun, uh, sundown to, sun, uh, to sundown on that uh, Saturday, I will have a little bit of peace. So now I'm going to open it up to my Jewish community. What does ritual mean to you? Go ahead and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to call on you um, to, to make things uh, less awkward of silence because I know everybody hates awkward silence. So I will call on you uh, and I'm going to ask, what does ritual mean to you? And how does it keep your, uh, you, how does it keep you going? I'm going to start with Rabbi Laurie Green. How does ritual, what does ritual mean to you? And how does it keep you going? Uh, especially asking a rabbi just to start off with. So thank you so much, Rabbi, for joining us. A rabbi is trying to eat her lunch at 314. <laughs> Tutors about mental student at four o'clock when this is over. But um, okay, great question. Great question. What does ritual mean to me? Whew. Um, I mean, I'll add a part, uh, like kind of a sub question, which just for me, I'm not saying anything else after this, but just like, has that changed with the death? Um, what does ritual mean to me? A rabbi? like a quick and sing uh, <laughs> ritual to me is a way to connect my, my physical social and psycho spiritual worlds like for lack of a better word I mean there's all the terminology is very you know 
not perfect, right? And we can parse it, but um, you know, living in a, however we're raised, all of us are to some extent or another living in a Western society that thanks largely, but not entirely to the Greeks, um, has this idea that like the body is separate from the soul and, you know, the intellect is separate from the body. And like, if I need a tooth pulled, that's somehow not my medical insurance because like only this one part of my body is like not the rest of the body. I don't know, right? Um, so we have this, this kind of false separation that I certainly grew up with strongly and um, just like coming into my body and coming into embodied practice and um, spiritual connection, you know, I can go through the motions of a ritual wrapping up. Um, see, this is why you shouldn't call on a rabbi talk too much but like two, two <laughs> this I'll be done like um I certainly can go through the motions of a ritual and not really feel anything uh and that is probably common for at least many of the Jews that I know um but good ritual really brings together all those different parts of my being and all of those different kinds of like planes of existence Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's call on Judith Eleven, if you can uh, participate here. What does ritual mean to you? So primarily, I, I'd say ritual to me is about um, something that helps to connect with the with my Jewish community and with my Jewish practice. So it's a matter of connection. Thank you. I'm gonna call mm -hmm. on Jose. Olagues, what does ritual mean to you? Oh, I'm going to unmute you. Well, there you that's, go. That's good. None you could hear me. Thank you for calling on me, Eddie. Um, to me, ritual means things that have become, uh, how should I put it, uh, repetitive in my life. Uh, along with the communities that I am part of. As uh, Rabbi Lori mentioned, it brings together my physical life and my spiritual life. And as I do ritual, I become closer to the groups that I'm part of, uh, primarily those that I uh, am part of spiritually. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate all of your answers. Uh, we're going to go ahead and ask on a couple more people, and then we're going to transition to our, our next dialogue question. I'm going to call on Joyce. Joyce, what does tradition mean to you? Tradition or ritual? Ritual, sorry. <clears throat> but they're both. Yeah. Well, for me, uh, ritual and tradition, ritual connects, is a connection to me of a much higher level of, of the creator and everything he has created. And for over 35 years, I have been very, as a Jewish woman, but I've also been very involved with um, Native American people. And it's like my other life, my, my life. I can't separate them. There's no possible way that I can separate any ritual that I might do, like even Shabbat, I am still thinking of people I am blessed to call relatives and also um, humble, very humble. So I don't see it connected to an intellectual part it's it's telling the story and as a storytellers when we for me when I put myself in the place of a ritual every single thing is sacred everything and um and it takes me to another place a place I I know, don't always know where it'll be <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it's a beautiful place and it, it's a loving place and sometimes a very emotionally 
it's real. And um, so I could say a lot, but for uh -huh. now, I'll be quiet. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you so much thank for sharing. All, thank you, all of you, for sharing. I know that it's it's like it's nerve wracking, right? When somebody just calls on you uh, right off the bat. So thank you so much. We're going to go with one more person and then we're going to transition into our next question. Don't worry if I haven't picked on you and you're like, oh, I want to talk. We'll have room for that as well. I'm going to ask on Jacqueline, what does tradition mean to you and or ritual? And it's interesting. Um, I recently attended a lecture by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and he said, if you want to develop national identity, tell the nation's story. And so for me, I think that that ritual is really um, that identification. I can't tell you I always experience it in a deep spiritual way. Often, yes, but not always. But even the repetition and the repetition in a community, which is why I think Minion is so important to have a certain number of people there both as witness and participants, and giving you that sense of community. But I, I do think that knowing your story gives you that grounding. Um, so you know where you've been, where you are, and hopefully where you'd like to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. So now, like my next question here is now that we've kind of uh, broken into the, the question of ritual and, and tradition, for me, something that has greatly been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic has been that ritual and tradition. I miss having Shabbat dinners with Rabbi Shmuley and in his house. I, I generally miss it. I miss the interactions of, of, of breaking challah with everybody. I miss the interactions of, of really uh, stepping into shul. I know a lot of folks missed out on that uh, for high holidays as we're coming out. I'm interested to see uh, in our native side, Debbie and Rosetta, how have folks adapted uh, to really joining um, events now to stay up to date with tradition and cultural events to keep up? How, what does the adaption look like? And did, did it feel the same if, if folks joined virtually? What, what, I'm, I'm interested to see what you felt. We can go either with Debbie or Rosetta. Hi again. I'm trying to get my lighting right here. <laughs> <laughs> I had to come to a quiet part of the house. So if um, my lighting is, I keep messing with it. Um, I'll, I'll give up at some point. <laughs> um, I think a big part of adapting is just, um, is, is understanding how important it is that, um, I don't know, I think part of me really feels like I'm, I'm taking family and prioritizing it in so many different ways. And where before I would often go out into the community and I would find ways to tie my children to leaders in our community, um, to ceremony that is happening. Um, but this shift has actually really made it personal, um, is taking what I know and what I've learn, you know, taking a lifetime of teachings and really applying it with my children today. And I, you know, it, it's uh, raising that level of responsibility as a mother, as an auntie, as a grandmother, and um, making sure that I, I teach something um, at least once a day or, you know, something bigger, you know, at the end of the week or talking about the month and what it means. Um, so, in that sense, I, I feel like I've adapted really well. Um, I've had some really meaning, meaningful conversations. If it was, you know, two or three of us talking um, with with a local traditional or cultural educator and sharing a very, you know, intimate conversation about language or about uh, things that um, are extremely valuable. So I, I've enjoyed it. I've been able to adapt. Um, I do miss our ceremonies. I do miss going to a hogan and hearing the, the, the traditional healers sing their song. I do miss um, taking part in um, our coming of age ceremonies. I do miss um, the healing ceremonies that are really important. I miss cooking and being among women and knowing that that's one of the most important parts of our lives. So yeah, I'm adapting very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate your, your response. Rosetta, your, your response. How, how have you adapted to, to the pandemic and having to go on a virtual uh, path? Um, do you feel that it's as impactful or uh, how are you feeling about it? Well, I, I really enjoyed 
and I am enjoying staying home. I kind of found myself that I was um, spending a lot of time, a lot of my free time as a volunteer to organizations that didn't appreciate me. And so it was a really good time to pull back and weed out where my time was better spent. And I enjoyed it. I enjoy staying at home more um, because I can connect virtually with anybody across the world via Zoom, via Meet, via, you know, there's just so many different platforms that I'm still able to connect. And I'm able to connect with people that I would not have been able to connect with in the virtual world had I been out in the community. You know, people that are in Puerto Rico and Canada and London, you know, we are having these daily conversations now that are inspiring me, that are fulfilling me more so than my immediate community members. You know, not that I'm dismissing the immediate community members, it's just my horizon has expanded so vastly that it's worldwide now. And that's what I enjoyed about and still am enjoying about being part of the virtual pandemic world. Um, yes, I miss some people, you know, we were in a room just on Sunday with, you know, 20 different beautiful Native American community leaders and uh, change makers and political activists. And we were in the same room, but we weren't able to hug. We weren't able to shake hands, but we were all in the same room together. And I just enjoyed that energy. And that is the energy that I miss, is that in-person exchange. And I know I saw Debbie there, but we were six feet apart and you know had limited dialogue, but we were in the same room. And that's what I really appreciated about that brief interaction that we had. But you know, I miss people, but you know what? I enjoy staying at home, I really do. I, I've kind of planted myself here, working on my garden and I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So now we're gonna go open it up to our Jewish side. Um, how, how were y'all folks uh, affected? I mean, we just went through high holidays. Um, how did folks feel? Did you uh, enjoy high holidays virtually? Did you feel it was as impactful? Let us know. We'll go ahead and start with Sam. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I actually, um, my, my mind is connected more to ritual because we actually, in our school in Akron, the Lipman School, we actually have a partnership with the Northern Cheyenne community. So we actually do, um, cross-cultural experiential education moments in both communities. We bring middle school kids together here in Akron in the fall from the reservation in Montana, and we go there in the spring. So, so you asked about high holidays, but this is the time of year when we do those exchanges and that has been severed. So we're trying to figure out how to, how to keep connected in a virtual way. And it has been a real, it has been a real challenge. And so I guess connecting that back to high holidays, I feel like the virtual anything is no, uh, it can't have the impact of, of real in-person ritual. And that's something I've learned from my Northern Cheyenne friends that, that ritual connected to place and earth and homeland and peoplehood is something that the Jewish people have lost. And high holidays, even when I could be in person, I never felt those things until I had the appreciation of another community that had a much deeper respect and understanding of those concepts. So these high holidays were even more challenging to connect to than generally, but I, what the rabbi spoke about at the beginning about our ritual not being lost on Jews, I think is a universal problem for the Jewish people that, that I think our native friends uh, who are keeping their traditions alive have, have a much deeper sense of and we have a lot to learn from them. Thank you, thank you. Let's move uh, to asking Stefan. Stefan, if you don't mind unmuting yourself and answering. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, actually, we enjoy the virtual services. We can participate or see every single Friday night service now at Temple High, which 
we really enjoy. Uh, very often we couldn't make it. Uh, the high holiday services, we thought uh, Temple High did a great job. Uh, they used Zoom to, to its fullest. And uh, I really enjoyed it. Jeannie, what do you have to say? My wife is going to. Okay. Well, uh, hi. <laughs> Where am I? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for hosting this. Uh, how did I enjoy the high holidays? Well, I made a traditional dinner. I think food is uh, central to the celebration of rituals and reminds us of connections to families past which we carry in our hearts. Uh, that's the beautiful thing to me about the Jewish religion and what I know of the Native American traditions. Uh, you know, there's a very deep connection to the spirit, spirit world and the creator. And uh, that is my, what I believe to be my daily connection, not just at the high holidays, but I pray every day, every night for the well-being of those who are ill, who are in pain, who are lonely, who are in need, and who need to grow spiritually, uh, including myself, because, you know, this is, uh, this is the circle of life. We never stop learning. So thank you for hosting this. I love hearing from our Native American uh, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Again, sharing is so powerful. Thank you. I know it could be intimidating, so I really appreciate all of you who are able to share with us. Um, we're going to continue to move on. Don't worry if you haven't had a chance to speak, I will get to you. Uh, so my next question, and this is really tying in our previous event with my great friend Rosetta here, where we talked about resiliency and something that is, is, is coherently shared by the Jewish people and by our Native American folks, the resiliency. What, how do you see your tie into ritual that keeps resiliency alive within your people? So how does resiliency tie into ritual and tradition? And, and how does that play out for you? Uh, we can start either with Debbie or Rosetta, and then we'll move on to our, our Jewish folks. I want to say that um, resiliency um, is, is coming through our stories um, each and every day. Uh, right now, there are many cultures that will practice storytelling um, in the wintertime, and um, and they use that uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a very practical sense and also a way to increase resiliency. Uh, but in a practical sense, um, with long winter nights, um, dinner would be served, people would be fed, and you would gather around the fire and, and everyone you know, contributed to stories. And those stories often um, identified symbolism or um, um, the ancestral journeys of of, of people who are really important or um, of it, um, I want to say like um, there were deities. Um, and so those would come out during the long winter months. And um, the reason for that is because the creatures that are out here outside, um, it's said that they can hear those stories. And because some of them are in those stories, they can't hear about themselves and what they've done. Um, and some, some humor comes through that too, like, you know, Coyote will, will say, you know, you, you're honoring those creatures, but you're not including me and he'll get jealous and he'll try to change things. And so there's humor in, in that sense, but traditionally speaking, it's meant to connect and bind all of the generations from grandparents to parents, to children, um, to adolescents, and then to children. So, you know, pulling together these, these four generations and making sure that each of them know those stories. And um, many will describe those, those real traditional storytelling, but there's also storytelling of the modern day, you know, making sure that our children know where the wheat was grown nearby or where the wood was gathered or some of the activities of like right now is pinion picking. That's a big thing. And uh, just going to take children to be a part of that, to help out with that and to share or the harvest from the corn, all of these have different kinds of um, resiliency. And so um, I'll, I'll let 
um, Rosetta share more, but um, it's it's really important um, during the pandemic, making sure that our children understand that they have a natural set of skills and uh, places where they can draw strength really helps them get through hard times. Thank you. Thank you. Rosetta, do you want to elaborate maybe? The storytelling, you know, in my tradition, in my culture, it's the Lakota culture from South Dakota. That has all been done for me to participate in via these virtual meetings, um, you know, sitting in on the, the virtual storytelling. And there is a small group. I think there's like four of us that get together via Zoom. We used to gather just, um, you know, intimately uh, the years past and just visit because that visiting is our cultural connection. And these are the young women and, and older adults here that lives here in the Valley in Tempe that are Lakota that practice their culture. And we would just visit and share our personal stories that we had collected over the years. And, you know, like I said, my, I'm continually growing in my culture because of the fact that I didn't grow up in my culture. And so having that connection, unfortunately, is lost because we can't sit in the same room anymore, but we can gather via phone. You know, we call each other and try to stay connected. But the, the, the have to remain connected and appreciate the cultures out there such as the Navajo and the Hopi and the cultures here in Arizona, the Salt River, Pima Maricopa Indian community, the Gila River Indian community, you know, they all practice their cultures. And now that our time-wise though has been limited to how we collect those stories and how we tell those stories, um, we have to stay connected. We do, um, regardless of how that happens virtually, via phone call, via a FaceTime, please stay connected. And I try to stay connected with my immediate group here in Tempe. So, you know, I, I really admire, you know, I, I can't say this strong enough or many times is how Debbie has stayed connected, you know, living here in the Valley, being a business professional and a cultural keeper that she, she is sharing her stories with her three daughters that they're gonna grow up and they're gonna remember these stories. They're, they're gonna remember sitting in the Hogan, they're gonna remember that cultural exchange and that is what ties you to the land and to your language. So thank you, Debbie. I appreciate both of you. So now we're gonna open this up to our Jewish counterparts here. Uh, really, how does resiliency uh, tie into your tradition? Um, as a Jewish people and a native folks, we've, we've seen what it looks like to get persecuted and almost eliminated. Uh, I'm gonna ask our question. We're gonna start off with Jose. Jose, go ahead and share. Um, I'm gonna unmute you here. There you Am go. Am I muted? Yes. Yep, you're good to go, brother. Uh, all right, question, Eddie. Um, you know, earlier, the question was asked, how did we adapt to the situation? And uh, as many others, I did have problems at the beginning. I felt lost. But, you know, eventually, I got to the point that I saw the, uh, the benefits of uh, Zoom and other, uh, you know, other uh, applications to be in touch with my peers, with my neighbors, with my family. But the resiliency came back particularly for me uh, when I traveled to Texas to perform a wedding for my oldest grandson, and we made it a family reunion. So having been with the family, we did talk about uh, you know, what makes us family and remembering the traditions, the rituals, and uh, the things that we remember from their growing up 
And now in this case, there were three generations there. So we were able to share uh, history, tradition, uh, rituals, and it included you know, things like uh, eating uh, and celebrating uh, birthdays and holidays and traditions and that that helped me to be resilient and uh, you know coming back to what it used to be and what it needs to be because being lost when I was at the beginning of this pandemic was no fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna call on Rabbi Lari. Thank you. The question was, uh, just to reiterate so that everybody knows, what is your feelings towards resiliency and how tradition ties into that as a Jewish people and in counterparts? Of yeah, great question about resiliency. Um, I think the fact that any of us on this phone call are here right now and not only on the call, but like in the world is um, just definitely a testament to resiliency um, in our peoples and our personalities. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I think that in order for, you know, a culture really can't be resilient without the tradition and the ritual and the language, the language that is so in danger of getting lost. Um, and as Jews, we have multiple languages that are so in danger of getting lost, you know, not just Hebrew. Um, and that's really important. I, so the one, one uh, example, the quote that comes to mind is um, a Jewish thinker named, uh, well, nicknamed Had Ha'am is famous for having said that uh, the more than the Jewish people have kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath has kept the Jewish people right meaning that it's not that we're all so diligent and always keeping you know the sabbath day in this traditional way or even non-traditional way uh that's clearly not true um and it's not just you know a 21st century problem right that's happening a long time um but just the fact that it exists you know the fact that it exists that um you know, we have these different understandings of time, of work, of money, of community, of um, all of this, like just the fact that some of us keep it some of the time is a big part of keeping us, like keeping our culture, keeping our sanity. Uh, and so I guess that's a really good example of resilience. Thank you so much for your answer, Rabbi. Okay, I'm gonna call on Judith. So um, I agree with Rabbi Lori about how tradition and ritual contribute to resilience. I'm in a new community and with COVID, um, it, it was very challenging meeting new people and staying connected, but with Zoom and the programming that the Jewish community offered, it, it was really a godsend. And then we had fires, people losing their houses, being evacuated and people came together to support them. And, and it, was, it was really beautiful how life went on and, and people came together to participate in the traditions and the rituals. So I think that fed our resilience. Thank you so much. And we're gonna go finally with Joyce before we move on to our next question. Uh, okay, thank you. <clears throat> I love talking, so you're going to have to cut me off. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. First of all, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, resilience is the focus of all my work. I've been working with children and families all over, everywhere, for a trillion years, over 40 years. And my whole focus is not on trauma, but it's on resilience. So the study and the knowledge and the looking at the beautiful essence of when a child is born, they are born with this perfect ball of light. It's like an old Hawaiian story. I lived in Hawaii uh, many years. And um, 
and and it says that every child is born with that perfect bowl of light and with the bowl of light the child can swim with the fishes and ride on the backs of sharks and fly with the birds and be fine but in life there are negativities that happen and there are hurts and pains but this grandmother says from the 1800s is all the child needs to learn to do is turn the bowl upside down and empty the stones because the light is always there. Nothing will take that light away. So I think what happens to us as myself, and I'm speaking about me personally too, not, you know, but I'm, I look at the stories and stories when, when you want to try to hurt the people, you take their stories. So when we tell our stories, simple stories, baking bread with my bubby, my grandma, you know, that just brings my heart joy. It brings me hope when I'm now I could be in someone else's home where we're making fry bread. And it's reminding me now of fry bread and sharing the same feeling of that I had with my old grandma, my bubby with, with this grandma. So it's, there's a connection and I don't, I guess I don't see my, I, I'm learning more about my Judaism because I, after my husband passed away four years ago, um, life changed dramatically. And I happened to learn about um, Rabbi Alush. And I'm not Orthodox <laughs> and I'm not any of this, but there's something spiritual that touches me beyond the literal words. So I love listening to the stories. And I know that the children need to hear, you know, when we're listening to what people are saying, it's the stories that connect us to the light that's within each of us. And, and this is our resilience and we were born with it. Thank you so we much. We are born with it. And to stay connected to it, there's no pandemic, there's no amount of Zoom that will take that away because it's within us and it's our connection beyond what we, and for me, it's beyond what I see in my literal world. It's, it's inside. Thank you, thank you. So now we're gonna move on to our next question and the question that is so exciting to me and because I love food. And I think there's a, such an important part of food and tradition, especially for uh, our, us in our Jewish community and speaking from the I here, us in the, in the Latino Hispanic community, always have a food to go with the tradition. Uh, Debbie and or Rosetta, if you can share your favorite traditional food that you love and maybe describe it so that we can all get envious and hungry right now. Some of us are in lunchtime, but I would love um, if you can talk about your favorite food and kind of how it makes you feel. And we'll do the same thing on our Jewish community. I think my favorite food right now is um, <clears throat> blue mush because uh, it, it can be made and prepared in different ways. It's it's usually grown and harvested and you know shared among um, the community. And um, you can use this to make bread. You can use it to make um, a like a mush, like a cornmeal mush. And um, you can use it in a kind of a moist uh, form, kind of looking like a tamale or something. Um, but there's a lot of ways you can use that and exchange it and make pancakes. Um, but um, a lot of the love and the prayers that went into growing it is one of the one of the most important parts and then just sharing that openly. But that's my favorite treat right now. Um, and I really enjoyed this time. I, I hate to leave, but I've got another meeting that I've got to prepare for and I'm, I'm double I'm double booked on so many days and this is just one of them but that's uh, something that's really important. I'll send a link so that you can read a little bit more about how important the blue corn mush is. Thank you so much, Debbie. Rosetta, what is your favorite traditional food? I'd love to know. Well, here um, in my household, I'm not the cook. My husband is the cook. And so I generally, he's a barbecuer. He loves barbecuing his meats on the outside grill. And traditionally, the foods, like we don't do fry bread, you know, fry bread, as, as many as people love it, it, it's not healthy. You know, it's fried. It's just dough. 
Um, fry bread, in my mind, was made out of desperation from the products, the staple products that were given to the native tribes. Um, and they had to make do with what they got, the flour, the lard, the sugar, the salt. And so we don't do fry bread in my house. Um, it's just a delicacy that I will seek out once or twice a year. Um, but I like the, what we call in the, the Lakota language is warjapi, which is a choke cherry pudding. It's a choke cherry pudding. You can make choke cherry jam, but it's derived from the berries that grow, you know, wild out on the, the plains. And so when you harvest them, you can, you know, go buy a handful, you can harvest a handful and eat them as you're harvesting them, or you can harvest a gallon bucket full, and then you make what they call warjapi, which is you just boil the, the choke cherries down, extract, drain out the, the liquid juice, and then thicken it and make it into a pudding where you can just eat it as a pudding or you can dip fry bread into it. But that's, um, you know, it's a dessert. And I, I'm a big fan of desserts. I love desserts, but you know, you just, you can't eat it all the time. Um, you would have to flavor it, of course. It is a little tart, a little bitter, but you can put sugar in it. And so that, of course, is a seasonal, seasonal treat, but you can uh, freeze your choke cherries. So you can make jam out of it. You can have choke cherry jelly, jam, and, but I like it because it's, the product grows wild. All you have to do is go out there and harvest it. Thank you, thank you. So now we're That's gonna open up, uh, to our Jewish side of, uh, of things. We're gonna start off with Judith. Share us uh, with us your favorite uh, traditional food. Uh, my favorite traditional food is challah. Love challah. I have friends who bake challah every week, every Friday night, Friday for services, for Shabbat. Um, I have yet to learn how to do it, but it's, uh, that's my favorite. Thank you, thank you. Next, we'll go with Jose. All right. Um, I grew up in a home where my mother said, your meal was not done until you had something sweet at the end of the meal. Mm. And I still practice that. It doesn't have to be an elaborate cake with you know, lots of sugar and, and frosting and blah, 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 blah. But uh, a small, sweet uh, portion of, we used to have lots and lots of rice pudding and things like that. But my very, very favorite continues to be flan. Mm. I love flan. I love flan. It's one of my favorite foods. Okay, yes. we're going to go with Jacqueline. I'm going to go ahead. Oh, there we go. I'm going to, you are muted. Yeah, I, I said I've been vegetarian for about 25 years, and the only thing that I really miss is my mother-in-law's chicken soup. Mm. Um, she made the most, really the most amazing chicken soup, and we always had a batch of it in the freezer between visits. Um, so I make great matzo balls. I don't make such great chicken soup because I don't taste it. <laughs> so, um, but but for me, that really represented Shabbat and holidays. And um, and my grandmother made great gefilte fish, which if you've had it homemade, then it's stuff in the jar, you know, it's stuff in the jar. But the homemade stuff always, you know, it always represented somebody who really loved you and put the time in and put this stuff in front of you. And then my grandma would hover and say, is it good? Do you like it? How is it? Before you got the first bite in. So it's, it's a whole gestalt for me. I love that. Let's go with Sam really quickly. Yeah, I'd go with the challah piece as well. I think that um, in my home, my wife and daughter bake challah and they take the portion and, and burn it and we don't eat it. And so it's like one of the few ritual, it's an example of ritual that is very, very old that we still do in the home that is connected to food that helps us, you know, just be 
be more thankful, be appreciative and recognize that not everything is for us um, and that there is sacrifice in this world. So challah and the ritual associated with it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, we're gonna go, get ready to close up here. But before that, I wanted to share a story because I think this, this story connects everything together. So here at Ariel Zedek and in coalition with VVM and other partners, we were able to help over 40,000 asylum seekers who uh, were coming here from um, uh, Central and South America. And a lot of the folks were really uh, indigenous in, in the areas of, of Central and South America. So they spoke Quiche, and I did not speak Quiche. I, I speak Spanish fluently. And uh, I've had a group of, 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 of about 10 Jewish volunteers getting ready to make food. That was their thing. They were like, we're gonna make food. I'm like, perfect, perfect. So I, I have them all ready to go in, in uh, one of the local churches that was hosting us to, uh, to be able to provide support for asylum seekers. And, and the folks arrived and I had to go, I had to go get some more, uh, some more things. And I get a frantic call. They said, Eddie, they're not eating. I'm like, why, what do you mean they're not eating? They said, no, we, we made them all this food and they're not eating. And, and I'm over here like, okay, well, what did you make? And she said, well, we made matzo ball soup and we made Israeli salad, but they're not eating. They're just looking at us. And I said, okay, well, we're going to have to modify a little bit. Let me go ahead and we're going to make some rice together. So I went down to the local Costco and bought a bunch of rice and, and some chicken. And, and I taught them really quickly how to make some, uh, some quick Spanish rice. And I got some frijoles so that we can learn how to make frijoles. And all there, the, the Jewish moms, all of them got so happy that finally folks were eating <laughs> finally everybody was eating and they're like oh yay we, we finally made made the food that they want and i thought it was really funny uh how uh hundreds and hundreds of asylum seekers have eaten so much israeli salad and <laughs> matzo ball soup coming in here from from phoenix they have had a jewish presence with them all all the way so uh i appreciate everybody sharing their story of, of their favorite tradition and i think it's really important for all of us to really think thoroughly and understand how our cultures may seem so separate, may seem so long, may seem so far away, but in reality, what connects us is so much more abundance. What we share traditionally is so much closer than we think. And that's where we can start to draw on from to, to truly create community effort, to create allyship, to stand hand in ha hand with communities who are marginalized, communities who are under attack. I love the, the civic engagement that my great friend Rosetta always presents. I bet you Rosetta has a sing, every single plan to vote and she's making sure that all her friends and family members have a plan to vote. Uh, she makes sure that everybody that she knows has access to that. And also working in, in community collaboratively. In our Jewish community, this is what really tikkun olam means. Repairing the world means repairing it together, means repairing those outside of the Jewish community and coming together to truly make a world that works for all of us, not just some of us. Thank you so much to everybody, each and every one of you who spent this time with us. A huge thank you thank to you. Debbie and my great friend Rosetta. Remember to have some hesed, some kindness in your heart and in your soul. Remember to have some patience, avlenut, some patience in your heart. Remember that we get through this together. I appreciate every single one of you. If you want a copy of this recording, please reach out. We will be more than happy to send it to you. And again, I encourage you to follow up on all of our events as we continue to make the dialogue happen. Everybody have a great day. If I don't see you tomorrow, Shabbat Shalom. Take care, everybody. Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Take care. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Bye, everybody.